They have a lot of this stuff going around about the Jew is you. Israel is forever forsaken, never to be restored. This is foreign to the scripture. The Apostle Paul, unfortunately for him, was in darkness concerning this great revelation that has come to some of these latter-day people. Or he didn't know about this. He looked forward to a restoration of the Jew. He loved them. He did not hate them or cut them off, but he loved them and looked longingly for their salvation and was urgently concerned about them. I'll tell you this. Satan has hated the Jew from the time Abraham was called out and set apart. He has hated and despised the Jew because the Jew is the one who preserved the word of God, contrary to all the efforts of Satan to derail it. The Jew is responsible for us having the Old Testament. The Jew is responsible for the New Testament, for it was Jewish people who wrote it. And they are responsible for, for preserving the Old Testament. They are responsible for producing the Messiah. And for this, they have received the undying hatred and everlasting contempt of Satan. Now be very careful about people and movements that get into Jew-hating. No matter how well-intentioned they are, no matter how uh, sweetly they may proclaim their love for Jesus, they have fallen into error when they're, they're beating the big stick. Their big stick is trying to uh, thrash out the Jews. Now, Jews can be as mean as a snake. They can be as bad as Judas, or they can be as good as Paul. But so can Gentiles. Isn't that true? Now, Paul is talking about when Israel stumbled, and Israel stumbled at Christ, it threw salvation, deliverance, and healing to the Gentiles. And he said, if they're falling, if by their falling away, in, their, uh, in verse 15 of chapter 11 of Romans, Romans 11, 15, if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? Now, why would he speak of a receiving of them if there was not going to be one? That doesn't make any sense. There is going to be a time when God will receive unto himself not the entire Jewish nation, but a remnant thereof that has been born again by believing that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And in some future point of time, there will be a nation created out of them. And they will be received. For God has purpose from the beginning, if you read the scriptures, to receive them. Now I know there are a great many scriptures concerning spiritual Israel and spiritual Jews. And indeed we are. And there's nothing wrong with that. And as such, we have access to many promises. But you don't have to cut off the natural people from the future that is reserved for them for God. It doesn't rob you and it doesn't enrich you to take away from what God is going to do to them. Don't you realize that God's big enough to bless the Gentile church and the spiritual Jew and the spiritual Israel and he can also bless the national Israel and make them a spiritual Israel, which they are not today. The Israeli government is anything but godly. And I do not defend anything they're doing wrong, but I do say this, there is a purpose reserved for that people and their very existence on the face of the earth is proof that God's in the heavens. For otherwise, Satan would have blotted them out a hundred times over. That the Jewish nation has always been a small nation among the nations. Compared to the other nations around it, it has always been a speck. And other nations larger than the Jewish nation have been completely absorbed, assimilated, and destroyed by larger nations that overran them. And the Jewish nation has had its share of being overrun and conquered and, and assimilated, hasn't it? And yet, the Jews were scattered to the four corners of the earth by judgment of God. And guess what? Everywhere in this world, there are Jews. They speak every language under heaven. You go to the Orient, you'll find Jews. You go to the Africa, you'll find Jews. You go anywhere in this world and you'll find them. And they're still Jews. You come to this country... And you have colonies of Germans, Lithuanians, Latvians, Italians, you name it, uh, every kind of nationality in the world. 
But this huge melting pot has so amalgamated, most of us have even lost track of what our lineage is. Right? And you don't think of yourself primarily as that nationality. The strange thing about the Jews, as though for generations they have been scattered among the nations, they are still Jews. Now God put that mark on them because he planned, he has a plan for them. And Paul knew about that and he said the casting away, if the casting away of the Jews and their rejection of Jesus brought a marvelous sweep of blessing and salvation to the whole world, what do you think it's going to be like when they're received? If their failure brought absolute blessing to the world unparalleled in the history of the whole world where it multiplied millions would be saved, if their falling away was the occasion for this, then how do you think God's going to celebrate their coming back? And by the way, how do Gentiles get to Jesus? By sovereign grace. How will the nation of Israel be, or the nation of the Jews, or Israel, be regathered in belief instead of unbelief? How will that remnant be selected? By sovereign grace. It won't be the things that men decide. It won't be the things that the theology professors uh, meditate and, and uh, uh, perambulate or whatever. It's going to be what God does by sovereign grace. And he will bring them by grace just like he did Abram in the beginning. He just set his love on Abram, an idolater in an idolatrous country, and said, get thee up and get thee out. And by sovereign grace, Abraham got up and began to walk. Not my land. If I was picking, I'd never pick Alice. Would you, you know? I certainly wouldn't have picked Al Roberts. My. <laughs> you know, you get to thinking about it. Who did the picking? If you're going to pick somebody who's going to make it, you'd say, where are the successful? Where are those who've made a mark? Where are those who've obtained the applause of the world? That's the ones I want to pick. I want to pick a winner. I want to pick a loser down about to commit suicide on the verge of insanity and doing all kinds of crazy things and can't just uh, I give up you know and yet isn't that where just about all of us were if I was picking I wouldn't pick some upright hypocrite in the church saying I am righteous I am righteous lost as a goose in the windstorm and didn't know it and yet God picked me out of that bunch I was sliding to hell from a church pew when God got me you can do that too. You can hit the skids up or down. It doesn't make any difference. You're still going the same place. But you see, God, by sovereign grace, reaches in and picks us up. And then we turn around and become very judgmental. Well, they don't deserve it. Well, who does? Nobody deserves the sovereign grace. The gracious treatment we have received at the hand of the Father through the Son is absolutely unbelievable. I never cease to be thrilled when I think about God reaching down and saving me. I like that song when he reached down his hand for me because, law, that's what had happened. When the Savior reached down for me, I was lost and undone without God or Son. Still the Savior reached down and saved me. Wow. Now Paul said, if the whole world practically was reconciled to God by their disobedience, what shall the receiving of them be? What's it going to be like when God says, guess what? I've triumphed again over the ancient foe. He said he's going to get them all, but I've got a remnant. Just like I did in Elijah's day, I've got a remnant. Wait, coming to this workshop. I'm going to preach on wanted fire on the mountain. Listen. We need the power of God to fall. It's beginning to move what Anne was talking about, about restored kidney, that's only the beginning, people. People are always saying, well, why don't you have more power? Why don't you have more power? We're working on it. We're getting ready. We're trying to get in the flow where God is. It's not that we're working God. We're trying to get where God's working. And if we get in the middle of where he's working, we'll be swept into power like we've never seen. 
like the world. It's never seen. It's going to astound the world. And I'm beginning to wonder if it's not going to have to break out in one place and spread, just like deliverance did here in the beginning, that it may have to be a bombshell place to get it started where people can come and see. That's kind of exciting, too. It, wow, that's motivation to get in the middle of the track where God is moving, to get ourselves lined up with the Lord, isn't it? Now, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? He said, it's going to be just something spectacular. If the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches are broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, verse 17, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. If thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. You see, the old olive tree is pictured of Israel. And the branches, a lot of them were broken off because they rejected Jesus. But the breaking off caused us to be grafted in. And he'll say, I believe a little later, it was we were grafted in contrary to nature. Because when you're grafting, it's an interesting thing. You take a wild tree... And you graft a tame sprout into it, a tame branch. And that branch then begins to produce the fruit you're after. You don't want the wild fruit. But this is the tame olive that God had raised up. And the branches were broken off because of unbelief. And he said, you were grafted in, and you're the wild branches. Old Gentile, wild. You're grafted in contrary to nature, going backwards. And he said, don't boast against the branches that were broken off. Look down and say, see, you're broken off. You're through. He said, don't boast against the branches that were both broken off. Because right now, he said, you are living off of the root of that tame tree. That root is Jesus. And said, your life is coming because you're grafted into that rich flow. And they were broken off. Now, he said, uh, boast not against the branches. If you boast, you bear not the root, but the root. He said, don't act like you're the ones carrying the root. He said, the root's carrying you. You're grafted into a Jewish root. Why are, you, why are you condemning the very thing that's carrying you? And he said, well, he said, uh, thou wilt say then, the branches are broken off that I might be grafted in. Isn't that wonderful? Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. He said, you got in by faith. What are you boasting about? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And faith is a sovereign gift of God. Be not high-minded, but fear. <clears throat> if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he not, uh, also not spare thee. In other words, if God threshed off the natural branches because they didn't believe, don't you get all puffed up. You got in by faith. You'll stand by faith, won't you? Now, behold then the goodness and severity of God on them that fell, seven and severity, uh, but toward them, or toward thee, goodness. He said he dealt very severely in judgment with those who turned away, but toward you he gave goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not in still in unbelief, Y'all do what? Be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. They say, oh, it's not possible. He says, God's able. Why, he put you in a wild shoot in there, contrary to nature. How much better would the natural branches fit back from where they came? And if thou wert cut out of an olive tree, which is wild by nature, and grafted contrary to nature, contrary to the way you graft things, because a graft, you put it in a wild tree. You put the graft in a wild tree. And this is contrary to the way you do it. Contrary to nature, into a good olive tree. How much more shall these, which are the natural branches, be grafted in their own olive tree? He said, you're just talking, hooting in the wind. Boasting against the natural branches. He said, if God did a strange thing like grafting you in, that was harder to do than put the natural branches back. And I don't know why it is that Gentiles sometimes get so filled with pride and arrogance that they feel compelled 
to shove the Jews away and say, well, they're finished and they'll never rise again. I, it has to be demonic because the Scripture does not so indicate. The Scripture talks about a restoration of the Jew to a place. Now, how it's going to come about and exactly all the details, we may have some differences about how that's going to be. But the fact that it's going to happen is absolutely sure. And the way God does it is going to glorify Jesus. It's not going to be they're going to slip in through the back door some other way. They're coming the same way. They're going to come through the door, which is Jesus. It'll not be another door. It'll not be a stranger. It'll be him. And the church is going to stand by and praise Jesus when they see it happen because they're going to say, Hallelujah, Paul's prayer is being answered. That remnant is being swept in. Thank God. And all through the ages, there's been a remnant of Jewish folk saved. God's never been without any. But there's going to be a great host of them saved in this sweep when he, re when he does a restoration. He said, I would not have you ignorant, brethren. Uh, I would not, brethren, have, uh, that you be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits that blindness in part happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Now notice, blindness happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile comes in. In other words, until God is through pouring out His grace on the Gentiles and saving millions of Gentiles, when He gets that work accomplished, then there's going to be a change of economy and God is going to swing back into a purpose He had from eternity past and He will exalt that nation and put it in the saddle uh, and humble the devil with it. You see, Satan has said they'll never rise again. Satan has hated and fought the Jewish nation, and he has tried to put enmity and hatred in the hearts of Christians against the Jews. So they would not pray for them, so they'd not be concerned, so they would reach and greedily grab for their blessings. We don't need the Jewish blessing. We have more and more and more. Why would we want that? God has abundantly blessed us. Why be so selfish that you want to take away what God has purposed for them? I mean, it's like somebody has a million dollars and they want to reach over and grab somebody else's nickel and take it away from them and say, well, I want that too. You know, I mean, my, 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 we who have the riches of Christ, can't we afford to be a little generous, a little magnanimous and say, Praise God. I'm glad he's going to, He's God's big enough to pour out his blessings on them too. And before we get all righteous and all stiff-necked thinking we're so great and that's why God picked us, remember he picked us from slime and from nothing. And he, by grace, brought us in and no other way. Now, he says, um, until the fullness of Gentile come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. And he's talking about a real Israel, a real group that will be his. As it is written, they'll come out of Zion, the deliverer, and he'll turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now Jesus is that great deliverer, and he yet shall exercise that prerogative on that remnant of Jews. Well, this is my covenant unto them when I take away, shall take away their sins. He's looking forward to a time when the Jews will be again on the front burner and God will be dealing with them directly through the Messiah. And concerning the gospel, he says, for right now, they're enemies for your sakes. As touching election, they are beloved for their father's sakes. He said they've got a, they've got a string on God's promises because God <laughs> promised Abraham some things he's not going to ignore. He promised the patriarchs of old some things about those people and they're yet to be fulfilled. Now, the, the, the reaching out in grace to the Gentiles will not wipe out God's promise and the election according to his promises. Now, he said uh, they are beloved for their father's sake. Praise the Lord. God does a lot of things for the father's sake. You know that? You know, Solomon got off into a mess toward the end of his life. He got messed up dabbling in a bunch of garbage. Got his life so fouled up. And God did not, he held off judgment on Solomon for David's sake. 
if you're going to be mean as a snake, you better have a godly ancestor somewhere to anchor to. Did you know that? And had you thought about being the godly ancestor that some of your descendants are going to anchor to? That will cause God to reach out to them in grace? Sometimes when you wonder, is it really worth it to have to stand up for God against all these enemies? Well, think of it from this point. Is it worth it for you to give your descendants a godly ancestor to hearken back to? Somebody who prayed for you before you were ever even born. Let my descendants be godly. My, my ancestors were ungodly. But Lord, let this be the changing point from here on. Let my ancestors, let, let my ancestors I can't do anything about. My descendants, I want them to be godly. I want those to be men and women of God. You can claim that for your folks. Did you know that? I wouldn't be a bit surprised if I'm preaching because some godly ancestor claimed preachers in their family. Those who proclaimed the word of God. It does make a difference. And if you don't do anything else but provide somebody for an anchor post to God, isn't that, isn't that better than living for nothing? I mean, to have your sons, grandsons, and great-grandsons, and all your descendants down the way turning to God. You say, well, they don't look like they're doing it. Well, I don't know. There might have been some wild strains in my family a long time since that ancestor prayed for preachers in their family. But they snagged one down here. And look what, look what the result is. A small church with a leverage on the whole nation because of what's teaching. Do you realize this church and its teachings are absolutely affecting the whole body of Christ? And I find that just staggering to even think about. It amazes me. But through the books and tapes, the testimony of this church and what God has done is literally affecting the lives of thousands of people. Thousands. It's affecting far more people than if I built a church with 5,000 members. Because the thousands are uncounted out yonder who are being shaken by the books and tapes and the story of what God has wrought here by His power, by His grace. Wow. And did you, th did you ever stop to think that because you're a part of this thing that's shaking the nation and now even shaking parts of the world for deliverance? Because you're an integral part of this thing. Did you ever think that you've got a part in it too? It's locked in. It's not just Pastor Worley's story, you know, that's going on. It's the story of this church. It's the story of the unfolding revelation given to a body of believers who've acted on it and continue to act on it in spite of all opposition and because of this, this church is small, but it's wielding a tremendous influence for God and for Jesus Christ. It's not just, uh, it's not the, uh, we're not inspiring the Mushroom Tabernacle movement to go out and build churches everywhere. We're talking about building lives. We're talking about rescuing the perishing, caring for the dying. We, we have found a way to minister that every believer can become a minister. Every believer can move into direct contact with God and begin to attack the enemy and succeed. And these methods and these things that have been revealed to us and have been tested here and have been put into practice by you people are literally rocking the Christian world right now. Literally thousands of people are being affected by it. And I find this to be unbelievably amazing. The printed page and the tapes combined have, have done a tremendous thing. A tremendous thing. I often wish that some of you could hear when I go in these meetings and person after person comes up to me, hugs me, and tells me to be sure and thank the church for their faithfulness to stand by the stuff, and tells about the testimonies. When I read that testimony in that book, I had hope for the first time in my life. I'd about given up. I just knew that I'd been everywhere. I'd ask everybody. Nobody could give me any answers. When I read this in the book, I thought, my Lord, that's it. Or when I heard it on a tape, and it's just, it's over and over, the same thing is happening. 
God is blessing. Now, I'd rather be a part of something that's doing something to exalt Jesus than just have a huge uh, high-rise building here on this corner, wouldn't you? I'd rather have a building like this than to have a colossal cathedral and you drive by and say, and this is our monument to Jesus, of course. But we helped. We mortgaged our house and our car to get it. And of course, we mortgaged our great-grandchildren, too. We'll never get through paying for it. But I'd much rather be a part of a living organism that is breathing life to each other and then reaching out and spreading what they learn to others. And they are in turn becoming living groups as well, not dependent on anything but the Word and the Lord Jesus. And to me, this is the most exciting thing I've ever seen. It's better than building a denomination, which will be taken over by the enemy anyway. It's better to train the people to minister one to another and to receive the help they need and to become ministers of righteousness. And I think this is what God purposed from the beginning. Praise the Lord. If the falling away of the Jews brought us blessings untold, what on earth will it be like when their restoration comes? Just take a deep breath and think, wow, if their being falling in disobedience and rebellion against God caused him to sweep toward the Gentiles with such magnificent grandeur, this, he said, think what it's going to be like when they turn to him and they acknowledge Jesus and they exalt him as Messiah and Lord, then we're going to get to see a second blessing that's going to be even greater, I would imagine, than the first. And then he says, I have a covenant with him. And God's not a covenant-breaking God. And in his own way, in his own time, he's going to bring this to pass. I don't know the details of it. Now, you can study some of these guys. They can tell you every jot and tittle exactly how he's going to do it, when he's going to do it, which day and which hour. Uh, of course, they have to change their charts and things year by year. They don't come to pass, but still, uh, they know. I'd rather just know he's going to do it and leave the, the fine details up to him. I can rejoice over the thing that's coming for now. I have so many other things to find out and learn about that I haven't had time to study all those fine points. And I'm not quarreling with those who do. I'm just saying, right now, I think it's more important to learn how to minister and be a minister and a soldier and how to be a fighting, winning soldier in the battle. Now he said, in times, he said, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He said, God is not going to change his mind. And he set his love on them long before you Gentiles ever had a prayer. And he said, he's not going to back out on that. In, as, in time, as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy on all. God put the whole human race under the same blanket indictment so that he could have mercy on whomsoever he would. How, he said, oh, the depths of the riches, both the wisdom, the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. He said, it's just impossible to outguess God. It's impossible to figure out past where he's going. See, he's got 10,000 ways out of an unbelievable, unsolvable dilemma that we see. He knows 10,000 ideal solutions. And out of those, he can pick any one of them and they'll work. And that's why Paul just uh, pauses in, in admiration and adoration to the God and says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how his ways are past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Well, there's several people running around that seem to know. And they'll tell you right quick, you know, they have a hotline. They get everything straight from right off the griddle. 
Some of it sounds like it's a little overdone, but they, they got it. Some of it's a little rare, very rare. So rare you won't find it in the Bible at all. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Well, some people seem to be his counselor too. They advise him on how to do things. Instead of trying to find out how he wants it done and fall in line with what he's doing. Or who has first given to him. Nobody's had anything to come and give to God. That song sums it up. A broken heart I gave. A worthless thing. An empty life was all. It was all that I could bring. Jesus filled my life with his love divine. He healed my broken heart, and now I know he's mine. Wow. You can't get much higher than that, can you? Praise the Lord. None of us had anything. We didn't have anything to bring him. He said, you didn't first give God something. Who has first given to him, and it shall be recompensed on him? In other words, how can you bring something to God and say, now, what are you going to give me in exchange? We had nothing to give to him except our need. For of him, through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. He just breaks out in a psalm of praise. Amen, he said, so be it. Notice it's, it's of Jesus, it's through Jesus, it's to Jesus, and they're all things are to him, to whom be glory forever. Well... It's a marvelous thing what God has done in these days to bring us face to face with our need and face to face with what God wants to do for us. Let's take a look at the first two verses of the 12th chapter before we leave this passage. These are verses that would be good for you to memorize. They're excellent verses to hide in your heart. He said, "I be, now all of this exposition on the grace, how marvelous it is to be saved, how we got saved, how Israel is going to be restored at a future date in God's economy, and the glory of their restoration will be greater even than the, out, the glory of the outpouring to the Gentiles. My, 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 we've got things to look forward to, haven't we? And then he says, I beseech you, I beseech is a very strong term. I, I beg you with the strongest urging possible, brethren, Notice not everybody, just those who are brothers, those who are part of the family. By the mercies of God, could be because of the mercies of God. The word here probably rendered a little clearer would be because of, based on the, on the basis of the mercies of God that you've just been discussing. Because of the mercies of God. He said, I beg you, because God has been so unbelievably merciful and gracious to you. That you do something now. Now, what are you to do? You're to present. That present just means to give. Your spirit a living sacrifice. Is that what it says? It doesn't say that, does it? See, your spirit's already taken over by the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, I just can't help it because I'm in this body. Yeah, that sound familiar? What did he say? I, he said, I want you to take and present your what? Body. A dead sacrifice. Blow your brains out. No. You know, did you know that a dead sacrifice would be easier than a living sacrifice? I mean... In a way, you know, they say, everybody that loves Jesus, if you don't recant, we're going to shoot you. You know, if you could run outside and be shot and go on to heaven, you'd say hallelujah as you went flying away. Sing that song, I'll fly away. And, uh, you know, they couldn't do anything more to you. Okay? In a sense, that would be easy. But to be a living sacrifice, that means every day. Yeah. In other words, you don't just have to make up your mind one time, okay, shoot. But every day you have to get up and say, okay, shoot. Mm -hmm. See, the living sacrifice has to be ready to be offered every day. That's harder.
But he said, I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, how, how do you want this to be? Holy. Ooh. Now, how in the world do you get holy? Well, I think you'll find the key right over here. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the pathway to holiness. That's checking up, keeping close tabs on yourself. Okay? Present your body a living sacrifice, holy, and this makes it acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Uh, the Greek comes closer to saying your spiritual worship. If you want to worship God, I hear a lot of people talking about, oh, we have to have worship. Oh, we, we have to go into worship. You want to do that? How about having some spiritual worship? Get down with the Lord, confess your sins, get yourself holy and cleaned up, and say, Lord, I give you my body. I heard old uh, doctor, I can't remember his name now, dear old saint that's gone to God, he's going to be with the Lord now. And he, he said a strange thing. He said, if you want to really put this thing into effect, get off by yourself sometime, lay down in the middle of the floor, and just start off with your hair, give that to the Lord, then your skin, then your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your tongue, and just go right down your body and give every member of your body to the Lord. Read this verse out. Say, Lord, you said you want me to present it. I'm going to present it to you. Now, I have to warn you, don't try that unless you're willing for something to happen. That's like I heard a long time ago, somebody, I heard them say, if you lift your hands while you pray, it's kind of different. Of course, being a Baptist, I didn't want to do it when anybody was around. And, uh, you know, like a spectacle. And, uh, but I did try it while I was by myself. You know something? Something did happen. See, a lot of these things will work. You say, what, 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 what? Well, you try and find out. But you just go from head to toe and offer every part of your body, and especially the parts of your body that give you the most trouble. Present those as a living sacrifice. And this is your spiritual worship. Now, uh, you may have to do this. You say, how often do this? As often as necessary. You say, my lands, I'd be laying on the floor all the time. Well, sometimes it starts out kind of like that. I mean, it takes uh, more work on it at first. But then gradually, parts of you will become in subjection. And you know more than I knew when I first came into this understanding of some of this. You know a great deal more. You and I know more. Now we know about binding and loosing to reinforce this. And binding off the spirits that would keep us from really being yielded, from these hands really being yielded to the Lord. So forth. We can lose spirits of God. There's a lot more we can do now. And the second verse says, And be not conformed to this world. Now, conform means to be poured into the mold of. If I had a fancy vase up here that had all kinds of curves in it, and I poured water into it, that water would conform to the image of that vase. It would take the shape of that vase. And he says, Don't be poured into the mold of the world. Don't. Uh, if you're poured into the mold of the world, you begin to look like, act like, talk like, smell like the world. Okay? Don't be poured into the mold of the world, but be ye transformed. Not conformed, but transformed. And how does this happen? Strangely, by the renewing of your mind. It all starts in your head. It's in your mind where the first fences fall. You first have to decide in your mind to let go, then you let go. As long as your mind doesn't break, you can hang on. So you have to have your mind renewed. Now, who's going to renew your mind? Well, who gave you your mind in the first place? To renew means to bring it back to where it ought to be. And be renewed uh, in your mind that you may prove... 
what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? Now, I don't want to be ugly, but I want to point something out to you here. Can you see why many people cannot ever really know the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? You've got to go through these steps or you'll never know the will of God. You can prove what's good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God if you go through these steps conscientiously, then you can check it out and, and see what God's will is. Now, most people and many people who run churches have never gone through this, and there is not a way in this world they could ever know what the will of God is. In years gone by, I've had people come against me and saying, well, I just don't think it's the will of God for us to do so and so. And I'd say, you're wrong. You're dead wrong. Well, I don't see how you can say that. Well, I knew them. I knew they hadn't even come close to this. There was no way they could know the will of God. Some of them just knew there was a church there by rumor. You know, they touched base three or four times a year. Just, you know, Mother's Day, Easter, Christmas, you know, just pop in the Happy Holiday thing. And um, there's no way they can, that kind of person can know the will of God. And many people who are going their own way, unless they are following God's program, could never know the will of God. All they can go by is what their carnal minds are coughing up and spewing up, which is garbage. Okay? I think before we go into the invitation, Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you to send angels to cut away the bondage on the minds of the people here. In many cases, uh, the enemy has been able to put steel bands around their heads. It brings pressure, misery, stress. Cut away the steel bands. Take off the steel cap that's been put on there by mind control. And in the name of Jesus Christ, cut away the cords, threads, hairs, chains, cables, Whatever means the enemy has used to bind the minds, I order those cut right now in Jesus' name. Let the minds, binding spirits be cut loose now and come out in Jesus' name. Move. Come out of there. Mind binding, mind racing, confusion. Come out now in Jesus' name. Move. Come on. Come out now in the name of Jesus Christ. Loose the people and let them go. Loose them and let them go right now in the name of Jesus. Loose the people and let them go. All the mind binders, come out of there. And mind control spirits, come out in Jesus' name. Loose the people and let them go. Loose them and let them go in Jesus' name. Come on, spirits that bind the mind. Spirits that bind the mind. Mind control, mind binding and mind racing. Leave the people now in Jesus' name. Loose them and let them go. Now, if you're here this morning, you've never asked Jesus in your heart, or you're not sure that you have, would you like to? You mind spirits, you mind control, mind binding spirits, keep coming out. Just keep moving. Just keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart or you're not sure you have, he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, we'll come in. I come against spirits that are clouding people's understanding of their salvation, causing them not to be able enjoy their salvation by filling them with doubts come out of there spirits of doubts and fears in the mind let the mind be renewed and restored now in jesus name as the people come with open hearts to the lord jesus if you can't get your salvation straightened out by all means come down to the front you say i need to talk to somebody about salvation that's all you need to say someone will sit down with the word of god and go over god's plan of salvation to see if that's what you're trusting in if that's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, and tormented, and this is producing compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops, or reverses spiritual growth and progress, we encourage you to come and seek help and deliverance. Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, so they cast out the devils. This is why we do it. We have a whole church full of people who are capable and able to get you help and deliverance from evil spirits. If you think you have this kind of problem, when we give the invitation, make your way quickly down front, and we'll have a worker assigned to you very quickly 
to help you in this area. Demons drive, harass, torment, and they produce compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops, or reverses spiritual growth and progress. This is how you can spot them working in your life. If you've got things like that in your life, and you're sick and tired of it, then by all means do something about it. Come and get deliverance. Another sign that follows believers, they shall speak with new tongues. If you haven't received this gift from the Lord, then we'd encourage you to come. And, and at least let somebody explain it to you. If you're interested, they could pray for you and help you to receive it. Another sign that follows believers, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. If you have physical needs, by all means come. There are people here who believe that Jesus heals today. We'll be glad to minister to you in Jesus' name. So let's stand.